Hello everybody. Good morning and welcome to the third and final day of the Apale Community Conference. And what a fantastic few days we've had up until now. We know that many of you have been watching us across both the Apale platform and a number of different social media. We've, you've watched in numbers, you've sent us questions and comments, and it's really exciting to see so many people engaged, inspired, provoked, and ready to think about how we can take forward adult education for the future. Today's theme is called Include, and we're focusing on how we can create inclusive skills opportunity. And I just want to remind you that over the last two days, we've talked quite a lot about inequalities. We explored what happens you know, when people lose their jobs, how reskilling can help, but also some of the challenges and limitations of that. We heard about the opportunities for, that AI could offer in terms of tailored individual skills pathways so people could have the learning that suits them at the right time and in the right chunks of information. We talked also about the dangers to democracy that artificial intelligence presents and there's not a day that goes by where there isn't some new story about manipulation on the media of information. So we talked about how adult education is more than media literacy or digital literacy or even just fact checking. It's partly about bringing people together to create new shared cultures and new stories together, working out what we have in common rather than the polarization and division that's often used in the social media. And we talked, our keynote speaker reminded us that what we need is a mindful approach to looking at new information because a lot of the things that are put on social media are designed to trigger an emotional response. And if we just take a moment and reflect more mindfully, think about who we trust, make sure that we've got an opportunity to explore things, then that allows us to get better quality information out of what's out there, how we can see the signal through all the noise. So that's just a recap of some of the things that you watched over the last two days. And you can always watch again, share with colleagues, so we know that this material is of use to you. The Apali community has grown. We now have uh, over 135,000 people actively engaging on the Apala platform, which is a great uh, figure. And more than that, we ask you to share your stories, what works, what didn't work, how your training journey has changed both you and the people you work with. And this year, we've had even more stories than ever before. And the year's not over. Um, but we've already received 89 stories individually written, telling us more about your experiences and what you want to share. So keep those stories coming. And later this morning, we're going to have the Apali Talks, where we will feature people who share their stories with us. So that's a really important part of that. And let me again remind you of the few ways that you can interact with us. For today's conference, we have two hashtags that we'd like you to be using. That's the European Year of Skills, because, of course, this is the European Year of Skills. And secondly, our theme for this year, which is Bloom with Epali. And we're hoping to see you share with us your photos, your images, your drawings, your notes, your messages. And maybe they'll have flowers or bright colours, because that's very much the theme this year. How training and education allows people to bloom and flourish for a way forward. So do share with us your images and your ideas on those social, social media hashtags. We will also be sharing a survey with you just to let you know we want to make sure the Apali platform continues to grow and meet your needs. And you can see on the screen there's a QR code. We promise it's short, it won't take you longer than five minutes to fill in, but we're asking you questions. What can we do better? How can this platform better meet your needs? What do you want to see us do to make it better? And of course, We'll have a couple of questions in the survey about this community conference to make sure that we're delivering what you want to hear and it meets your expectations. This year, we featured a new thing which is called My Community Badges, and that's to honour and celebrate those of you who are particularly active on the platform. And we're offering you badges and you can get as high as a gold cup if you're a sitter, sort of community hero. You've posted a lot on, on our Pali platform. We'll show you now just what these little community badges will look like. So the more you input, the more you engage with, the more you can gain and you get these new badges. So you can reach a collaborator and if you put even more on, you get this gold cup and that shows everyone that you're a community hero. You are someone who helps to hold that community and take it forward. 
So we thank you very much for everything that you've done for us and everything that you've shared. Um, we hope that this has been an interesting conference and we can take it forward. I just wanted to, again, let you know how things are going to go. We'll be having a keynote speech in the more, um, first thing, which is going to be looking at skills and inequalities. And then, as I promised, it will be the Apali stories where we will feature your work and we'll have a chance to talk to some of the uh, educators and learners who are engaged in the community. So that's what we're going to do today. And this is the third day of the Apali uh, Community Conference. And our, our keynote speaker said on day one something that people said, we should have that on a mug, on a cup. We should put it on, on posters, which said that education and learning is about reclaiming time about freeing up time for you to think, to reflect, to question the world. So that's a really good message that we use education as a way of giving us useful knowledge and really useful knowledge. So that's enough for me. I'm delighted now that I'm going to introduce our first keynote speaker, and that is Baloma Tudor Glock. She's a skills specialist for the International Labour Organization. And she's going to help us explore more about this really challenging issue of inequalities. Many of you raised that in your comments over the last two days, and we know we live in an unequal world. The impact on the world of work of some of these big digital transitions also falls very unequally. So the first question I'd like to ask uh, Baloma is, we've just been through a global pandemic and some sectors were much heavier hit than others. So can you give us a sense of how the pandemic changed the labour market in terms of skills requirement? Great. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to, uh, for me to give a keynote speech today as we discuss one of the most critical topics of our time, tackling inequalities through skills, uh, leveraging skills policies, skills measures. Uh, as we strive for a fair, inclusive society, it is critical to recognize the power of education and skills development in transforming lives and bridging the gaps that divide us. In locality, in all its in its all forms, it is present challenge that hampers the progress of nations. It stifles the social mobility. It perpetuates uh, poverty and limits opportunity for countless individuals. Um, if uh, I would like to just give some context and then talking about yes. why skills in lifelong learning is important and then moving to the like why do why we need to have human centered approach and then the the later I want to bring this all purposefulness aspiration as which you just talked about and then let I finally I want to close as like skills is only part of the solution but an important part. Could I go that flow? Because uh, thank you, thank yes. you. Cool. Um, so, mega drivers of change, including technology advance and digitalization, globalization, international trade, climate change, migration, democratic shifts, multi, uh, as well as the multiple overlapping crises such as pandemic, geopolitical tension, Ukraine conflict, ongoing bottlenecks in the sub global supply chains have created uh, challenges and opportunities for the world of work and labor markets. These trends are changing the way we live as well as socialize and work in creating profound changes in the labor markets. They're not only destroying the jobs, but also creating million, million, millions of jobs. But more importantly, they are also changing the nature of jobs. They are changing the job tasks within a job, right? As a result, the, the, the skills requirement and the labor market are changing rapidly. We find ourselves in a world where the divide between the haves and the don't haves is widening. Wage disparities have grown. Job opportunities have become more polarized. I would like to give you some statistics from the ILO's recent publication. For instance, in 2022, globally, the job gap, this is a new measure of ILO, is standing at 12%, meaning that there are 473 million people who are not, who want employment. Like that consists of 205 million who are unemployed plus 260 million 
who wants employment, but they are outside of the labor force. At the same time, also globally, two billion of people are working in the informal economy. And an estimated 240 million people, workers, were living in extreme poverty, meaning that they are earning less than 1.90 US dollar per person um, and per, uh, uh, in purchasing power parity. And in addition, women and young people are fair significantly worse in the la labor markets. Um, a fact indicative of large inequalities in the world of work. For instance, for every economically inactive man, there are two such women. And youth unemployment rate is three times higher than the adult ones. So historically, such disparities have roots in the combination of education and opportunity inequalities. In this context, education and the relevant up-to-date reskilling, upskilling, life and learning are uh, a moral imperative an economic opportunity and a catalyst for both social and economic progress. We, are, we want to have sustainable growth that is inclusive, meaning that for inclusive sustainable growth, we need both economic and social progress. Policies that promote equal access to quality education, training, employment opportunities for all are key to inclusive growth. Now I would like to move to why we need to prioritize skills development and lifelong learning. We need to prioritize skills development or education and lifelong learning, not only to address the challenges, but more importantly, to seize the opportunities brought by this overlapping crisis or mega drivers of change for several reasons. Number one, the pace of change in our world is unprecedented. Technology involves, industries transform overnight, global landscape is in a constant flux. To remain relevant and competitive in a, such an environment, individuals and companies must continuously adapt. Skills development and lifelong learning empower us to stay agile, enabling us to pivot, thrive, in these evolving circumstances. Secondly, uh, as industries involved, there is significant gap between the skills required by employers and those possessed by workforce. For instance, manpower talent shortage survey, the recent one indicated uh, almost 77% of the companies that are participate in this survey from 42 countries, um, they 77% of the companies, they have uh, reported that they are lacking skills that they need, right? This gap can lead to unemployment and underemployment for many individuals. By prioritizing skills development, we bridge the divide, ensuring the workers have the skills needed for the, uh, to access quality employment opportunities. Another thing is that if workforce equipped with quality and relevant skills is essential for economic resilience, because we also need to talk about resilience. The crises are happening more and more. more um, when individuals are well prepared for the jobs of the future, they contribute to economic stability and growth. Countries that would adaptable or highly uh, skilled workforce, they are better positioned to weather economic downturns, to capitalize on emerging opportunities. Of course, inequalities in access to education and access, skills development opportunities persist in many societies. Prioritizing skills and lifelong learning can help address this disparities when education uh, and training are accessible to all, regardless of their social background, we reduce inequality in great fairness uh, society. Lifelong learning are also likely to engage innovative thinking and problem solving. False, by fostering a culture of this continuous learning, we encourage individuals to seek creative solutions to the challenges that we have. This mindset of uh, the set shift can drive innovations within companies and stimulate uh, growth. Automation, also artificial, artificial intelligence, they are all shaving job roles, eliminating many jobs, which I mentioned, but they also create new opportunities in the new fields, emerging fields. So prioritizing those skills, uh, skills development ensures that individuals are not left behind. 
by automation, but prepared and to transition to new and relevant roles. Addressing global challenges like climate change and sustainable development requires a skilled workforce. By equipping individual with the knowledge expertise needed to address environmental issues, we contribute to a more sustainable future. In summary, skills development and lifelong learning are not just uh, they, they're not just a response to challenges, but they are a proactive strategy to harness the opportunities presented by this rapidly changing world. Um, and now, for instance, even prior to the COVID-19 at the ILO, uh, I, the ILO has been actively engaged in the discussion of future of work recognizing the need to address the challenges and opportunities brought by mega drivers. The ILO Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work in 2019 and the subsequent ILO Global Call for a human-centered recovery from the pandemic that is inclusive from the, uh, from the crisis in 2021 have highlighted the renewed interest, importance of education and skills development and life and learning as a key enabler of human development, full and productive freely chosen employment in this work. ILO Centenary Declaration recognizes the need to prioritize skills development and life and learning as a part of human-centered approach to future of work and highlights the central importance of social dialogue, as well as the highlights the, the, the it is a joint responsibility of government, employers, workers, uh, individuals to reskill, upskill, to uh, enhance their learning and education. Linked to that, I really would like to talk about, you know, uh, addressing inequality goes beyond just matching skills in our jobs. We need, it requires considering the alignment between skills, jobs, and purposefulness, sometimes some call aspiration. One of the key drivers of this recent phenomena that is especially in EU or in developed countries now common, the great resignation, quite quitting, is the desire to work uh, to, for a work that aligns with their own values and sense of purpose. It's no, it's no longer just matching skills in jobs. It's about ensuring those uh, that those skills contribute to greater sense of fulfillment, meaning of one's career. Individuals are seeking roles and resonate with their passion, with their values, and this alignment can lead to greater job satisfaction and retention. To facilitate this alignment, it is imperative skills development policies to, to really uh, promote purpose-driven work, for instance, provide clear career path, opportunities for skills development, advancement within the company, helping employees to see how they can contribute to the longer term of personal and professional growth. Another one is foster a culture of employee engagement where individuals feel their contribution are valued and that they are integral part of the company's mission, right? Uh, also, another point is that to what extent, to what extent the companies, organizations that are using the skills that, are, that they have, uh, we really need to, to, do, uh, to understand, to identify the underutilized the skills, allowing the job role adjustment that better align with individuals' ability and interest. And uh, uh, last but not least, recognize and reward employees for their contribution, reinforcing their sense of purpose and value. But also at the same time, aligning skills in jobs and purposefulness also holds the potential to create ripple of effect. For instance, purpose-driven work leads to more engaged and motivated workforce, which in turn enhances the productivity. When employees find meaning in their jobs, they are more likely to innovate and efficient. This is a positive uh, ripple effect. Sorry about that. By providing equal opportunities for skills development and promoting, um, let me do that, <laughs> diversity and inclusion, organizations or companies can also reduce the inequalities. 
in the workplace. Everyone benefits from uh, a level of playing field, right? And last but not least, purpose-driven work often aligns with the sustainability goals that we have now. For instance, employees who are passionate about the company's mission to make a positive impact on the society as a whole can contribute to sustainable growth. In conclusion, the great resignation or this quiet quitting phenomenon underscores the need to shift uh, from our focus, mere skills in jobs matching to aligning skills jobs and aspirations. By implementing skills policies that encourage the, this, this alignment, we cannot only address the challenges by, by, um, posed by this phenomenon, but also pave the way to a more productive and equitable and sustainable world. The last but not least, I would like to talk a few seconds about skills is not only the, um, uh, skills is only part of solution but an important part. Um, because uh, um, to, um, how is it? I mean, skills development, while crucial, is only part of solution to address the challenges, right? To comprehensively tackle these complex issues that I have raised, we need multifaceted approach, encompasses not only skills, but also broader strategies in consideration. Let me just talk a few of those. For instance, skills development relies on access to quality in education and training. To ensure equal opportunity for all, we must invest in education infrastructure, address disparities in access to learning resources, provide financial support to those who cannot afford training, Without these foundations, even highly motivated individuals may be unable to acquire those skills they need. Skills alone are not enough if we don't, if there are no jobs, no job opportunities aligned with uh, those skills. So they, therefore, come governments and policymakers, industries must collaborate. They must integrate skills policy to create an environment where demand for skills, skilled workers matches the supply. This involves designing economic policies that is comprehensive and encourage job creation in those sectors where skills are in high demand, right? Another SNI law, so addressing inequality requires more than skills development. It necessitates inclusive economic growth. Policies should aim to reduce income uh, disparities, provide social safety needs for those who are unemployed and un underemployed, ensure those workers receive fair wages and benefits. Uh, the last, also not least, the pursuit um, of skills development should also align, as I mentioned earlier, uh, environmental sustainability that address climate change and other environmental changes. We need not only skilled uh, workers, but also policies and practices that promote sustainable practices uh, in industries and communities. Uh, such as like uh, responsible consumption, responsible production, all those. These are all integrated policies are really important and the skills in there is key. Many of these challenges face, we face are really uh, global in nature, such as climate change, pandemic, international cooperation and diplomacy are essential to address these issues effectively. Skills development can enable individuals to contribute to global efforts, but it's a collaborative approach uh, that we will drive this meaning, meaningful change. So at the end, I mean, skills development is a powerful tool but its impact is maximized when integrated into holistic approach to address economic, social, environmental, ethical, all this dimension. Thank you very much. I think I went too fast. Thank you very much, Baloma. It was definitely a whirlwind tour of the sort of environment within which skills and skills development is seen. And you mentioned a couple of things that I'd like to explore a little bit, which is, um, you mentioned you know, there's a, a large proportion of people out there who are not in the labour market. Some of them would like to work. Some of them just uh, are just completely outside it and not having access to it. And, and you mentioned, you know, that uh, that for if I if I remembered correctly, for every man there's two women who who want to be in work, and then then even further than that, there are th three young people who are outside the system. So I wonder if you could 
comment on you know how stereotypes and uh, discrimination affects uh, the labour market and how a skills approach could counterbalance that. You're you're mute. You need to unmute yourself. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, therefore, we all we are saying that skills are a powerful tool, right? And we really need to make sure that um, I was also saying it's also a combination of this um, inequalities into of inequalities of education in access uh, um, education and in um, opportunity inequalities, right? So really, we need to have policies, uh, even skills policies to to really try to make sure that that everyone has an access to quality and uh, relevant skills. And it's not only that, we also need to put that in the broader comprehensive policy approaches because it has to be followed up by different policies in that only then it's synergized if we can make a change. Thank you. I, I know that we we've spoken in, in in our preparation call about you know the this the chasing of GDP and growth, but that growth needs to happen in alignment with the SDGs, but in a human centered way. And I know the ILO has been part of some quite big conversations about the the future of work and how to contribute to sustainable growth. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I, earlier also I mentioned you know like. What are we aiming as countries, you know, as a whole together to really have this sustainable, fair, inclusive growth, right? So that can happen only when we have economic progress as well as social progress, right? So we really need not only the efficiency, but we also need the resilience, meaning that we really need to uh, make sure that all uh, everyone is equipped with the right skills, or at least the opportunity to have a good quality education that is really giving them opportunity to join the labor force, right? As I said, I mentioned that this new measure, before when we are measuring the, it was usually the unemployment was the main indicators, but that wasn't showing everything because unemployment are those the, the, that are looking for jobs that are in the labor force. But there are, there are 2000, no, 268 million, even more than the unemployed people are who want in the job but outside of the labor force. So we need to have a policy to make to, to bring them back to the labor force like uh, really through com comprehensive policies. But another thing also just to link into that, I think um, it is important for countries also to, to, because we do not have like all the money and finance available, right? So we need to be focused. So of how to focus, I think on that, we also need to focus on those key sectors or really sectors that are, Align with the future of work, or that are uh, uh, that are really in uh, how to say, uh, that are taking into account also the supply, the base of the country. Like you know, we really need to identify those sectors that can you know the the, the lead the growth of the country and all be able to generate jobs, and then also the, the skills in education system should not be coming as an afterthought, but it has to be in the beginning when we're designing, when we're finding a way, when we are agreeing on investment or trade, different policies, education uh, policymakers, education, the, the players from the education side has to be on the table, discussing with them together, considering the supply side as well, and really, uh, making sure that education is really uh, as used as um, proact a proactive strategy, right? Okay, uh, thank you, Baloma. We're starting to get some messages and questions in from our audience via social media. And we've had a message from Flore, a question, um, and they've asked, investing in skills can truly bridge gaps in the labour market, or are there systemic inequalities that cannot be tackled 
at least in the short term, by skills development. Now, you've, you've said that skills development, you know, is important. It's not the only thing. But how do you see them as um, working on this issue of inequalities? Difficult question. <laughs> it's exactly to the point which I am saying that we really need integrated policies. Uh, skills should be a part of the solution. We cannot rely on only on the skills and then we can solve this issue because starting even even which skills it has to be really in line with other policies what you know what what are the technologies uh, going to be used in the labor force in the for instance in the sector that we are focusing what type of technical skills. so all the skills that have those skills has to be relevant right so only then we will have an impact so this working together because it's naturally working in the skills in addressing this uh, skills gaps and the skill shortages really like because we have so many diverse stakeholders working together so these stakeholders need to work together they need to develop a shared understanding and then they need to also develop uh, propose uh, solutions that works together Thank you. I wonder if you can uh, comment a little bit on the, obviously this is a European platform and although I'm sure we have some people engaging beyond Europe, we're mostly uh, within the European Union, but at, at the ILO you've got a global perspective. Are you able to give us some sense of how you see um, the impact on Europe's labour uh, market? We know that we're, we're getting older in Europe, um, but when you compare Europe to other regions in the world, do you see, you know, more input on skills, less input? Uh, have our policymakers really got to grips with what needs to happen in terms of upskilling the population? I think Europe is really doing. I mean, they are at the forefront. They have this. They uh, announced this year Skills Year, right? And I mean, one of this. The, the challenge, which is not really a common in develop, developing countries, but rather in Europe or in developed countries, are uh, the ones that I mentioned. You know, this, for instance, uh, recently when I was in, uh, in a meeting with Swiss counterparts, Swiss partners, and they were saying that last year, the first time they had more people quitting the jobs than joining the labor market, right? So what is this? This is the what I was mentioning, this great resignation, now uh, quite quitting. They really need to align their purpose, their values with the organizations or companies' um, mission of uh, the, the goals. They want to be recognized. They want to be valued, you know, the youth. So we really have to take into account those side of the uh, element, especially in the context of this uh, youth un un unemployment, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the unemployment rate is globally uh, three times bigger than the adult one. We really need to have a specific like um, a, a focus on this, how to make sure that, you know, all really working with companies, big companies, or making sure that they use the modern practices of uh, work organization, people management, so that they really use the skills they have to the extent possible, allow them to have this flexible pathways, as well as the um, uh, career guidance counseling is provided in addition to the skills. So skills development is not only, but a skills utilization as well as this supporting policies are really important in, 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 uh, in obtaining the, the needed change that we want to have. Thank you. We've had a question from Sandra, who, and she's concerned about uh, the fact that women are at you know lower employment rates at every educational level, which tells us it's really a, a sort of structural issue. It's not, um, you know, that women are, don't have access at the lowest or even the highest skill level. We see this throughout it. So do you see effective policies addressing that gender disparity? 
Yes, yes. This is also another vulnerable groups that we really have to. In, in addition to that, you know, also this uneven recovery of the pandemic or from the crisis, we can see, you know, really women and youth, they are affected disproportionately. So we have a range of policies countries are doing, really the supporting, you know, what is the root cause, you know, for them to have unemployment? Because it is this, you know, child care policies or maybe more flexible, giving them the the the, the opportunity to remote work, you know, all this the, the um Supporting policies are really important, and many countries are doing it. And this is, uh, I think, not only skills, but again, to really allow them to uh, seize the opportunity, they need to have this all the supporting policies also in place. Um, yeah. You you also mentioned in our, our prep call the the importance of the work to work transition. Um, and maybe you could pick up uh, on that, uh, you know, how sort of skills can play a role in supporting that. Because we heard yesterday, one of our speakers says that um, if job losses, particularly if a factory or a plant or, or a whole office closes down, it's often very sudden. And on average, it takes about 18 months to reskill and get yourself ready for another a job. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that work to work transition. Yes, that is really important point that you raised. I, I forgot to mention in the speech, I think. Um, yes, it's not only about a school to work transition because of all this uh, different overlapping crisis and mega drivers transforming the labor markets. Uh, we are not only, uh, the, you know, the, the the workers, they need to have they need to change the jobs several times throughout their life, right? There are studies like, I don't remember exactly, but five to six times in a, you know, and on average, for instance. So how do we, we really, I think the skills policy, labor employment, the skills policy, they need to really try to address this uh, to help the workers to navigate through this work to work transitions, right? There are, a number of policies that needs to be, for instance, you know, what type of skills are really important for them to integrate. And often it's reskilling, upskilling at a short time courses, right? So link to technologies or link to a certain uh, uh, the, the sectors that are booming, for instance. Uh, also in that sense, I think digitalization, technology advance, they are really a key in here, so the 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 the, uh, the, the help in this the the workers to really improve their digital skills and making sure that they can really grab those opportunities that are arising from this situation, and this is really important as well. And also the this um, recognition of prior learning, you know, that the learning and education is not only happening through formal, but it is also happening formally, non-formally. So we should really need to make sure that the policies also aim to promote those validation, accreditation, or recognition, recognition of those skills that are obtained through uh, non-formal informal way and also the uh, because more and more we have this micro credentials that can be stacked different skills and so that we can, can be able to move navigate right so these are also important um, and the quality of those courses that are being created like in a short time also important that we have to make sure guarantee those quality. And also uh, there are a number of policies. Um, uh, another one is that also this demographic shifts that in Europe we have that, you know, age and population. Uh, that is uh, also maybe that, that we need adults learned, I mean, for them to reskill up skill and, you know, through putting them together in a, in a team with the young worker to learn the skills. You know, there are innovative or interesting, uh, in incredible stories that are really helping. And um, yeah, I think that's for the time being, but there are many things that we can really uh, have as a supporting or like a comprehensive approach to help the workers to navigate this 
uh, work towards transitions so that they can um, have the decent employment. Thank you. We've had a couple of comments from people who, who are watching who want to, to also contribute. Um, so we've had a, a comment saying there are many barriers to education out there and they impact labour market participation and job security. For example, the places where you grow up, your family's socioeconomic background. So clearly people are, are really recognising some of the challenges and the inequalities. We've had another comment that says social disadvantages related to labour market outcomes tend to persist across generations and perpetuate inequalities. And maybe that links to the, the message we'd had before is, you know, if you come from a deprived background where not many people have access to jobs, that can go across the generations. Um, so and I'm sure you recognise these kinds of, oh, exactly. of messages. How um, Very good points. Yeah. How critical are skills to trying to stop this intergenerational transmission of poverty, exclusion and disadvantage? This is a crucial. I mean, the skills policies are again really crucial in this, right? Often, I mean, um, because the parents they were not able to do. I mean, if you can allow that, regardless of their social background, we give them opportunities for education and training, and and then with all the support and policies, I think it will allow them to really. Uh, break the glasses and you know be a movie and living in a better life than their parents and this really breaking this uh, inter uh, generational um this uh, inequality or poverty right yeah. okay um Baloma, we're coming towards the end of our time together and and let's imagine we have the we, we are in a very privileged room and we have the 27 ministers of employment and education in front of us um, and they're just preparing their mandate for the next five years what they'd like to do what messages would you like to give them uh this is really nice i would like to say a number of things i think i really want them to be in the driving seat to be in the initial discussions where the countries are really talking about what technologies, what sectors are going to, you know, be the next four or five years, uh, the, 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 the growth, uh, the, the key items in the growth, right? Really the, the pull in the country. So they need to be in that discussion and really trying to make sure integrated skills policies into the other policies, such as the investment, trade policies, employment policies. Uh, microeconomic policies it's really important to be on top uh, i mean as a driver you know really having skills as a driver for their development and the second thing is that again we are the skills mismatch uh, the challenges that comes from all these skill shortages are really because we have so many diverse stakeholders are working together and often they are working in silo or they don't necessarily speak the same language even, they don't necessarily have the same understanding about the challenges or the uh, problems they have or opportunities they have. So therefore they need to work together. Collaboration, collaboration coordination, this whole government approach is really key in this uh, making, you know, the, uh, reason, um, uh, the, the, the needed change. Uh, another thing I want to add, was that when we work on the skills, if we are working at the higher level, we can't do much than saying that, oh, skills are important. So really want to do, uh, the, the really solve the issues, we need to go down into the granular level, meaning that at the local level, working at the local level or at the sector level with this, concerned stakeholders, they need to find their solution, the local solution, for instance, really putting together the right people around together and working together and uh, uh, coordinating and synergizing the different policies. I think they are, they are the, these are the three things I would like to say. Excellent. Thank you so much, Baloma, for being with us this morning and sharing this the global perspective from the ILO and this amazing data that we have from around the world and a sense of the trends, the scale and the pace of change. That's been a big theme through through the last three days, but also uh, encouraging education um, 
and training to be in the driving seat, but out of the silos, engaging with others, having a conversation about the future of work, because that's where skills fit. It fits in that sort of connection between aspirations and what we as a society want, and then how we can encourage people to have access to the labour market. So, Balorme, it's been a real privilege to have you with us this morning, and a warm thank you on behalf of all of our audience on the Apollo platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk and have a discussion. Thank you very much. And I would like to wish a a successful conference. And thank you. Thank you. So the next thing we're going to do, um, as I've been telling you for the last two days, the national support services are doing an amazing job. And many of them have been convening additional workshops, um, bringing people together to have discussions as part of this celebration of adult learning the Ipali Community Conference. And we like to check in with some of them each time. And we're really excited that today we're going to be linking into Ireland. And I'm going to welcome on screen Mark Gerin. And hello, colleagues in Ireland. Hello. Steve, got Tina. Hello, everyone. And hi, Tamsin. Uh, it's Mark from Ipali. And I've got kind of team members here from different sectors as well. Uh, we've really been enjoying the, the, the conference over the last three days. It's been absolutely fascinating. Obviously, today, is the last day, which is about inclusion. And uh, we have our our own national event later on, which is about transgender and non-gender conforming uh, spaces in in adult learning kind of areas. Uh, So we're really looking forward to hosting that later on. It should be be interesting, all right. But we have really been enjoying listening to all the speakers and engaging and asking questions. Well, Mark, I was going to say you you are you have been very active and we've noticed you putting comments and questions uh, throughout the last couple of days. So a warm thank you for that. And for colleagues in Ireland, you know, really going to the heart of some really challenging issues. You're not sticking with easy stuff, but really opening. I know. Up we like the challenge. If, if you're going to tackle, use learning as a way to, you know, free up people's minds and open the space and the time for change, you're really touching on the heart of it. So warm thank you to everyone. Hello (laughs) and goodbye to colleagues in Ireland. Have a great (laughs) session later today. And keep posting on the the website. We love having your questions and comments. We will do. Okay, thank you, Tamsin. Yeah, thanks. Bye. So we now, as I promised earlier, we're going to go on to the bit we really enjoy, which is the Apali Talks. That's where we highlight heroes uh, within our community who've taken the time to share their story and as I said we had 89 so far this year and we'd like more so please send in some more but what we want to do is to recognize the key work that's being done by uh, people who have passion and who have commitment and I would like to dedicate this session of the Apali Talks to Wilma Greco who is the Apali Italy ambassador and she has been an enthusiastic participant in the Apali community stories over the last three editions. And she was also one of our speakers last year. Um, and she talked about how you run education in prison settings. Uh, unfortunately, Wilma died just a few days ago, um, and she will be sorely missed by many within the community in Italy and beyond. And we thank her for co- her contributions. So we dedicate this panel to Wilma because we know that her energy goes with us and her passion and her spirit. So we are going to talk about capacity building and empowerment for vulnerable groups. So let me introduce the panel, which will help us to explore all of that. So I have Maugavata Kozak, a policy officer from the European Commission, DG Education and Culture. Welcome. I have Greta Haugoy, who is an expert in lifelong learning. I have Wim Ipers, who is a prison educator and culture coach, and Damir Hopman, who is an educator in the field of culture. So welcome to all of you. Now we we actually have a a conversation between ourselves and at the same time people will be putting comments and questions and then we'll be answering some of the messages that come in from our panel. But the first thing I want to do is to recognize that the Apali Talks is all about stories. Stories of change and their stories are out there to be found and to be shared and they have the power to connect and they have a power to change lives. So really transform. So what we want to do is, in this conversation, tell the stories of the work that you're doing and how you, how you do things. So let's start by exploring the message that we talked about a lot from our, our keynote speaker, Valorma, talked about vulnerable groups. But that's actually quite a contentious term. You know, what is a vulnerable group 
and what's the difference between a vulnerability and a vulnerable group? How do we tackle them? How are how are people considered to be vulnerable? Who are they? I know that can be quite challenging. So Greta, I'm going to invite you to be the first one to pick up on this. You know, what is a vulnerable group? Yeah, thank you, Tamsin, and thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, to this panel. I'm really honoured to be here, and it's been uh, so nice to to listen to the previous uh, speaker as well. On vulnerability, uh, of course, this is uh, the reason why we uh, would like to address this in the panel is it because it's not a very easy term. Um, uh, like, for instance, if I take my own uh, story uh, that is, uh, you know, that you can find in the community, in the public community stories, I come from a um, working class uh, background. Um, neither of my parents had any any education. Um, and uh, but I never considered myself uh, belonging to a vulnerable group uh, until um, and, and probably one of the reasons for that was that um, I grew up in the 1970s in Norway, which was a very progressive society um, with, uh, with very strong uh, social democratic policies, like, for instance, with free education and the whole ideology of uh, egalitarianism and equality between uh, people were very strong. And uh, so it wasn't until I started university that I actually discovered that, uh, especially women from working class, uh, that uh, that we were a study subject, <laughs> that we were actually considered a, a vulnerable group. And so that's one of the things that I think that we should address here today is that um, the term can be a bit contentious. You know, it, it could be that you are not aware that you belong to a group and that you can feel that it doesn't really fit. But of course, it did fit because um, without... without the policies in Norway with free education, I could never have entered uh, university. You know, my parents would never, could never have afford, afforded, uh, you know, me going to university. And I also see that, you know, my parents, especially my father, he was really concerned. He saw that I was good at school and he wanted me to have an education. But he said, why don't you go into the military? Why don't you go, why don't you become a, a prison guard or something? where the education is paid and you are you are guaranteed a job you know this carefulness is very typical uh, of uh, of people who come from a background where nothing is secure thank you very much uh for that vim let me invite you to also reflect on this concept of vulnerable groups because we don't think of prisoners being necessarily vulnerable. I mean, they've been put in prison for a reason, right? And that's not because they were considered vulnerable. So maybe you'd like to help us unpack this concept of what, who or what is vulnerable and what does that actually mean? Mm. Yes, hi, Tamsin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Um, so I've been a prison teacher for 25 years now, and I'm still as passionate um, about it as I wasn't at the beginning. Um, vulnerable, yes, but I think to some degree or other we're all vulnerable, which is easy to say from my point of view. But um, uh, what we're trying to do uh, when, actually what I try to do when teaching and when working in, um, um, for theatre with um, people in prison is turn that narrative around and, and say, listen, um, for example, when I start a new class, I always say, listen, you have to, you have to, you can learn a lot from me, but I can learn at least as much from you as you from me. And you can learn a lot from the others. That's the peer-to-peer -peer learning that's going on. Um, what I mean to say is, yes, you are vulnerable in several respects, because you mentioned just before we took the floor, the intergeneration poverty, and that is going on. And there's lots of obstacles going on there. But if you if you focus <laughs> on them, you tend to um, you tend to make the mistake of just dragging them down. Because you, you'll never, you never be able to shrug off completely that intergeneration poverty, um, that lagging behind. So what you have to do, I feel very strongly, is focus on what they can do, focus on their capacities, and um, and and their and their peer-to-peer -peer learning, learning from each other to overcome these obstacles one by one, and and that may be a long-term job, and it is a long-term job, but but I'm really passionate about that. And so vulnerability, yes, but you can overcome it. Thank you. 
Damir, let me invite you to come in and again explore this issue of you know what does vulnerability mean? Is it the same as victimhood or weakness? What does it mean for individuals or even for communities? Um, hello, Tamsin, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants and hosts. Um, I'd like to say hi to all of you on this debate. Uh, so, to answer your question, what does uh, vulnerability mean in our case? Uh, well. Um, I'll just uh, mention the broader context of our work first in a few lines. Um, I'd like to briefly outline the objectives and background of our organization. That's um, Institute Buria. We are a um, um, non-governmental uh, grassroots small organization focusing on the empowerment of minority groups, especially immigrants from former Yugoslavia living in Slovenia. By that, we mean uh, Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs uh, in the uh, vast majority. And in some historical context, after the breakup of Yugoslavia and the formation of uh, individual states, uh, those minority organizations in Slovenia began to emerge with the goal of uh, uniting those immigrants to preserve their language, uh, culture and home and memories. And these organizations primarily organize cultural events and networking activities, uh, but often with less emphasis on education, what is most uh, really important, uh, because we can relate that with the com community vulnerability for them. But if we move to ind individual vulnerability, yes, our minority learners face uh, multiple barriers. These are geographical and class differences. Uh, the, uh, those are among uh, in major society as well. But in our case, the most important are linguistic and cultural barriers that provide a lot of prejudice from the major society. So um, to integrate our groups better into major society, uh, we need to educate both parties, uh, the vulnerable minority groups and the major society also. So to make uh, the right outcomes in the future, we just need to set the mechanisms of so-called uh, positive discrimination to empower these groups and to preserve their cultural heritage as an equal part of Slovene society in our case. We need to invest more and more uh, resources and energy into the, the, these areas, but especially in education. Thank you, Damir. Uh, Margaret Alta, let me invite you to come in and, and tell us a little bit more, particularly about the Erasmus uh, Plus program, because the traditional tools of, you know, um, learners going from one country to another, we tend to think of that as being something for the for the university level. You know, people go and do a semester abroad, people do a, a year to study a language, etc. But how can we reimagine how this mobility might be accessible for other people, for older people, for you know, people who don't have that same pathway? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Rosli, and um, uh, uh, welcome and very good morning from my side uh, to everyone. Uh, yes, indeed, the new Erasmus Plus program is uh, actually for everyone, so irrespective of their age and the status in the education and training activities. And uh, actually the Erasmus Plus program puts a strong emphasis on the um, social inclusion and to reach out to the uh, vulnerable uh, learners. So it would mean uh, that for the Erasmus Plus program, this uh, outreach should uh, be towards the uh, individuals who are um, at the most of the training and uh, education needs. Uh, and indeed, we have the tendency to imagine that the Erasmus Plus program is actually for the higher education student. And uh, it's not. We do have under the um, adult education sector the excellent examples uh, where the seniors, even 70 or 80 years, Years old uh, individuals go for the learning period uh, abroad. And actually, the main objective of such a learning mobility, the training uh, period abroad, is to um, boost the self confidence and self esteem of all individuals and to create the stronger willingness to learn further. Thank you. Uh, Damir, I think you've got a story you can tell us about um, uh, a group of adult, quite senior learners from Serbia. Tell us your story. Uh, well, uh, I wanted to say that uh, at the end, but yeah, of course, uh, just uh, pinch me the punchline. Uh, well, um, last year we were implementing the activities of our Erasmus Plus project, Open Hands. Uh, 
with the summer art workshop in Istria and Croatia. This was just beneath the coast. And um, some rural ladies from Serbia with all the mentioned before vulnerabilities, they were poor, they were from low class, uh, they were from rural area and also ethnic minorities they have participated in. And they are now maybe in their 60s, you know, uh, by their age. Uh, they have been saving up all their lives for the benefits of their kids and grandkids and uh, always pushing their own desires and needs aside. But uh, as they were great uh, handicrafts, uh, they participated in our workshop in Istria and that led them saw the beach and the sea for the first time in the, their lifetime in their 60s. And this is this was really incredible story, you know, full of emotion for, for all of us involved. And um, that'd be hard to achieve without their desire to learn and willingness to participate. And this was really enriching experience that motivate us uh, all to do more with our work in the future, no matter how, how hard it can get. Thank you, Damir. Greta, I saw you nodding as we, we heard the story from Damir about how, you know, uh, rural communities and others could come together and, and, and experience something for the first time. Is, are there any stories that you can share from, from the work that you do where you've seen how um, a, a learning project can deliver for a group that's experienced a discrimination or a barrier, can really open that up for them? Yes, uh, of course, there are, there are many stories like that. I, I, I love Damir's story. It's, it's really because it's so emotional, I have to say. But I think that to be an, an educator, you know, to, to work in lifelong learning, um, in adult learning, it's, uh, uh, I encounter, you know, so many uh, emotional moments uh, with, with people, uh, you know, uh, adults who have their, um, you know, who are experts on their own life. And then I'm able to facilitate something that with, where they feel that they that, that they grow or they develop. And um, I think that what we sometimes underestimate is the power of education and the power of learning. And, and like for myself and for many people I know, um, education is a is a path to, to freedom. You know, it's with with education, you can actually free yourself from uh, your family, from your cultural restraints, you can transcend uh, many of the of the um, uh, hindrances. You know many of the barriers uh, that are there that you, maybe you never believe that you can uh, ever get away from. And um, I'm not saying that you know people have bad lives and education will save them, but in many instances, actually, what you get is that you get some kind of power to choose you can actually you have uh, a power uh, uh, and an opportunity to actually choose your own life and and do something else and and um, this can be extremely powerful for, for many many people so um, i think we should never underestimate that power Thank you. Vim, I'm going to bring you in on, on this because, you know, we've been talking here, touching a little bit about motivation and, you know, this, uh, the possibilities that it can give you. But if you're in prison, there are there are some limitations to, to well, you know, you can't throw open doors and walk out. So can you tell us a little bit more about that motivation and the power? What does it offer people who are physically uh, stuck inside, who are locked up in one way or another? Yes, thank you, Tantin. And also, Greta, because I think what you said is, is exactly what I experience almost on a day-to-day -day basis in prison. Um, I'd like to start by another example, if I may. Um, I've just had a 69-year-old uh, man from Suriname who was a, a notorious gang leader um, for, for a big part of his life. And he was in my communication and assertiveness course. And he received two certificates. Um, and after those certificates, he said, um, this is the first time in my whole life I've received a certificate. He was a small man. He actually sort of grew a foot when he said that. Um, and I'll show my kids and my grandkids what I've done here in prison um, so as to show them that they don't end up um, in the same street life I've had my whole life. So that I found a very touching, very emotional moment. That's one thing from my communication assertiveness course. The other one is when you talk about transforming lives and, and that connects to what Greta said and also what Damir said. 
um, is that uh, actually if, um, when you start off a class or a theatre class or be that what it may, um, what you do is is hand them tools and give them uh, opportunities and possibilities and you feel like a facilitator. And actually slowly but surely people start opening up and they start sharing stories and they start um, sort of getting getting unstuck in some ways. Um, seeing new possibilities and starting to dare to dream again. Because very often you find people um, sort of um, shutting down all these, all these avenues to the future. Whereas when you focus on what their qualities are, what, they, what they're good at, um, and what maybe um, their talents can be um, uh, um, in, 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 a, in a life um, after prison, um, outside these walls, then, then a lot can happen. Then actually, education is is the magic powder. Um, so yes, I, I, I strongly believe that even in prison, even if you're if you're um, uh, locked in for twenty two hours out of twenty four, there's there's many possibilities to open up spaces in your in your head and in your mind and in your mentality, and to to make that self confidence grow and take your your own life into your own hands. Can, can we um, explore a little bit this, this idea of motivation? Because a, a lot of the conversation we had, and even with our previous speaker, we talked about how skills are going to be the key that gets you into employment. And that's a sort of external motivator to, to get you to your next job. But when you it's adult learning um, and it's not obligatory like it is in school, there has to also be some kind of internal motivation. In our prep call, you, you gave a really wonderful explanation about how um, with, with some of the learners you work with, you see this, this development of an internal motivation. Yeah, um, actually, most of the time when people come to class, they just want to get away from their cells which we now call rooms, but they're still cells. I mean, they're eight, eight square meters, so that's really small. Um, they just want to get away from it all um, and escape, really. Um, and then they get together with other people and share points of view and listen to each other. And, and you give them some contents and some ideas. And, and um, they, they, they run away with that. And slowly but surely, that, internal, that external motivation becomes an internal motivation. They, they start to rediscover what they actually can do. Um, so that is that is something which is so lovely to be able to witness and to be part of, really. Um, I've, I've witnessed it many times over, the, over the, 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 the past quarter of a century that I've been doing this job. But every so often it doesn't happen. So it's, it can be transformative, but it can be, people can be so stuck and can, can have experienced so much um, detention, um, so much, how can I call this, uh, detention um, trauma that they don't get out of it. That equally often happens. So uh, that is not so nice to witness. And there's not a lot you can do about that. Just be there and acknowledge what they're suffering. Thank you. I, I wonder if other members of the panel can also share some concrete examples about how um, adult learning is also a process of, of investing in yourself recognizing that you and your future is worth it and it's worth the effort if the the courses and facilities are being put there then it's also you have a value and you're worth it is that something you've uh, seen in your uh, both uh, Greta and Demi when you when you work with adult learners this sense that a recognition hey I'm worth it this is my skill I'm going to learn there's a place for me there's a place in society because that's what we we sort of say is one of the key um, external externalities of adult education is, is it it supports self-worth. Greta or Demir, can you share some concrete examples? Because this session is all about stories. So we'd love to hear more of that. Well, I, I could share. I remember I had um, uh, quite a few students who had to leave their profession. Uh, they were hairdressers and they had to leave their profession because they couldn't uh, um, stand anymore the chemicals that they used. Uh, you know, uh, they, they breathe in uh, uh, chemicals and also they got eczema and, and so on. So they had to, to change. And they, it was difficult because they loved their job, but they couldn't uh, work uh, anymore. And many of these were, all of them were women and they, um, 
they had started work uh, working very uh, early, you know, when they were like 20, something like that. And uh, so now they were in their 40s and they they were really lost, many of, of these women. And for me, it was important to say that, you know, you're you're still young, you know, you, you can you can really do something. Uh, you, you are going to work for another 20 years. So and uh, and what we saw was that the way that we that we uh, managed uh, the, the the learning uh, itself, uh, we we tried to to um, focus a lot on what they already knew, you know, and um, and not say that you know you have to start from scratch. We we started from the fact that they were already professionals and they just needed something a bit different, and but it was a long way for many of them to actually get the self confidence. To, to feel that they they could learn something new and new a new profession uh, and and turn, but all of them did, and I think the reason why was it because it was a group, so this kind of community learning I think uh, I'm always been a fan of that because I think that people can help each other they can support each other they can learn from each other and um, and by giving to other people. Uh, you can actually uh, become much better yourself. Uh, so this was something that I will always remember that group of <laughs> ex hairdressers because they they were such a lovely group of people who all of them managed to discover uh, something else in themselves um, during that uh, that course. Thank you, Damir. Do you want to share a story? Yeah, of course. Uh, um, well. Um... When we talk about motivation, you know, I'd say that our biggest challenge was always how to motivate our members to join in our learning programs. And um, I would just like to outline that maybe Erasmus Plus program with its uh, relatively straightforward project management uh, concept and financing is also ideal for a smaller organization like ours is because uh, uh, it has proven to be a great fit for all our educators and uh, and prime groups as well. So we have been, since we are, I don't know, only seven years uh, uh, young organization or old, uh, you know, we've been pondering how to make education more accessible to our members because uh, uh, it was evident that our learners were most interested in topics related to, I don't know, their home country or uh, such as, uh, I don't know, cultural heritage, language or literature. And uh, by confronting these um, uh, challenges, uh, we had to really dig deeper to understand the uh, real needs and preferences. So we could have designed those uh, more flexible uh, learning programs to best fit their needs and expectations. And uh, uh, because our uh, adult learners uh, need m m motivation to come after work to our workshops that, uh, I don't know, late afternoons, you know, after, I don't know, seven, eight, ten years of working, you know, uh, laboring. Uh, so what did we do first to build that motivation? First of all, we needed to introduce more flexible learning programs into our work. And to do that, of course, we needed to implement the knowledge from other organizations into our activity, especially from abroad. We didn't have that knowledge, you know. And therefore, we start to join that uh, Erasmus Plus uh, mobility programs to gain more and more good practices, uh, work methodology and personal knowledge and competencies, you know, of our educators. Uh, 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 for instance, like for seven years ago, we were really struggling how to write our application uh, right. But today we are the Erasmus Plus accredited organization for adult education in Slovenia. And that provides us really a new specter of opportunity, especially for group mobilities of our learners to, to other countries. And for example, uh, we have that specific uh, elderly uh, women group. Uh, they create those uh, exquisite handicrafts. Uh, they are typical for their regions, you know. But yeah, they, they, they were always lack of knowledge of how to promote, package, uh, or market those products, you know. And consequently, we've created those programs that resonate uh, with uh, in compassion in God uh, and creative uh, initiatives, as well as uh, we put inside digital arts and uh, visual arts, you know. Uh, so, but with all that that mobility activities, uh, their motivation to actively participate uh, is only going to grow because we are already having a great interest to participate in. Thank you. Malgazata, let me let me bring you in. You've heard some of these stories um, and and I'm sure they, they're lovely to hear as someone who's, who sits in Brussels for the Erasmus program, hearing the changes that makes to to lives, but when we talk about um, you know equal opportunities, maybe you could tell us um, 
do we have equal participation across the age spectrums and what what needs to happen to make sure that the opportunities that are there are equally accessed um uh, yes uh, indeed thank you for bringing it up and uh, indeed uh, congratulations to slovenia actually it is one of the uh, of the best countries when it comes to the implementation of the mobility activities for adult learners uh, because it is very well uh, developed at the at the local level in uh, in the country i also see in the comments that the um, colleagues from the audience they have a small scale project for uh, adult education that's uh, that's also uh, great because it gives the opportunity for the smaller organizations and grassroots uh, organizations uh, and also they have more uh, possibilities or opportunities to actually bring the program closer uh, to the citizens and indeed uh, we would like to have more le more more learners in uh, adult uh, education and in training activities uh, however it still uh, remains the challenge uh, despite of the um, uh, very heavy work of the organizations active in the adult education field uh, and also the different um, job that needs to be done to reach out the um, adult learners especially uh, here it is important to provide with the dedicated mentoring or uh, uh, peer learning or counseling also introducing the the benefits uh, um, and that the learning can change the, um, the prospects life for the for the adult learners that it is not only um, that is something uh, that reinforces the, for example, key competences or uh, increase the um, lower literacy level, but also that generally it is something positive and um, uh, and brings the benefit for the long term. So uh, at the same time, we appreciate uh, a lot the, um, the difficult job of the adult education organizations, in particular passing the positive messages um, about the benefits of, of learning. And the Erasmus Plus program uh, supports the organizations in, uh, in that, especially when we speak about the financial support, there is a dedicated inclusion support for the organizations uh, who carry out the um, mobility activities for vulnerable groups, so for uh, participants with fewer opportunities and also the inclusion support for the participants themselves based on the reimbursement of the actual cost uh, to address any barriers the individuals might have in access to or participation in the mobility activities. And just let me uh, maybe very briefly um, illustrate one example from Finland, Finland when uh, there was one person Person, uh, who uh, went for a training period abroad. The, uh, the person comes from a disadvantaged background and uh, actually the project coordinator um, bought the necessary things to go abroad. It was the new pair of shoes and uh, the person uh, benefited from the learning period abroad could uh, learn uh, new IT um, solutions and also could become more independent and more uh, motivated. And uh, when um, the person be, uh, came back to Finland, uh, enrolled for a new training program and it's much and now is much more motivated. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to bring in a couple of the comments that we've received uh, from our audience so far. But with our conversation a little bit earlier about the the um, the issue of sort of vulnerable groups and vulnerability, we had a message from Katinka who said, you know, could we move from the many predefined target groups and ready-made labels towards letting people actually define themselves? Um, because she says, if categorizing people is easy only from the outside, the closer you get, the more sensitivity and respect that you need. And we've got a, a question from Petra that I think uh, Vim is aimed at you, 
which says in Sweden, some young men choose violent gangs, drugs and murder instead of education and a more normal life. It's like they don't see a future. What could we do for these young men? And I imagine, Vim, you see many young men like that in prison. What would, and maybe you've spoken to them about it, what would have helped them make different choices and, and, and see that there is a future for them through education or employment? Wow, that is a that is such a tough question to be answering in a couple of minutes time. I mean, I've been spending 25 years trying to deal with those matters. Um, <laughs> the only thing I can say, and, I, and, and I, I've been stressing more uh, rec in recent years, is that we need to get all levels on board to be able to actually generate real transformations. Um, I've been involved, fortunately, in also a Train the Trainers program. I've been teaching prison staff as well, because prison staff are very often left behind where our education is concerned. Um, they're, uh, I mean, these people do very, very tough jobs. They're 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 a vulnerable group, really. I mean, they're they're constantly threatened and 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 um, uh, abused, and and very often work in very uh, harsh conditions, and yet they don't get any education worth mentioning. Um, so training is absolutely key. Training the trainers, training prison staff, i.e., is is absolutely key. And then as as these young men, uh, as for these young men, I mean. I think the same goes for every human being. If you succeed in um, in in really focusing on, it's the same story all over again. I'm sorry, but if you can succeed in focusing on what they actually can instead of what they can't, um, at the, their qualities and their their talents instead of what's gone wrong in the past. So if you don't just focus on the past but on their future and keep telling them there is a future for you, in whatever context, you will be able to get your life back on track with all the help that you need, obviously, and with all these levels included, then yes, there is a small chance that, that there is improvement ahead and that you can transform your life. I mean, that's a sort of a very general answer, but that's the way I feel it. And there's a lot of work to be, do be done still because, um, um, the odds are against us. I mean, I mean, world population has increased from eight million to eleven and a half million in, in, in almost twenty years, and, and there's more women incarcerated in twenty years as well. I mean, there's there's more strikes going on. There's there's less funding for uh, the judiciary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So stacks are. I mean, odds are stacking up against us. But still, um, the, what Greta said and, and Demir also said is we, we need just heads down and keep on working and and trust that things are will will work out. Greta, I know that um, one of the areas you uh, work in is understanding that um, early school dropouts, you know, there's often a link to the mother's educational status and therefore what she can offer and what the family can offer. Can you give us something about the, the sort of how you are looking to do in interventions and how you've worked on that issue? Well, it, it's true that um, in in Norway we've had uh, quite a lot of analysis on who are the dropouts and um, and of course there are a lot of, uh, of reasons why people drop out uh, and of course some also come back very easily uh, but some are are just lost to us and um, and what uh, the researchers saw was that uh, one um, common uh, factor uh, for many of the uh, young people who, who dropped out was that they uh, grew up in families uh, where education was not the priority and that especially uh, the mothers um, had low education level. And uh, one of the things that I've been concerned with is that we should take that kind of analysis, we should, we should base our policies on evidence. And, and if this is true, then why don't we educate the mothers? Um, because what I feel is that uh, often education is, uh, and all the initiatives we have within education, they are just compensating for um, structures and situations which are um, very difficult to actually uh, approach or you'll do something with. So I think that we, why, I think that schools uh, and educational, uh, you know, facilities and including prisons and so on uh, are doing a, a lot of, of good work, but it's much of it is 
compensatory. So I think that if we start addressing, like Wim also said, addressing the actual problems in society, um, for instance, uh, low education levels, discrimination, racism, uh, uh, the low trust in, in politicians, um, you know, the, the future, the, the climate change, you know, there are so many things that actually uh, are, are troublesome in our societies. And, um, and it seems like we think that if we only do a little here and there, a little, uh, some initiatives on school level, this, this, can, this can change. But I, I'm, I'm not very optimistic about that. I think that we need to, to change our societies in order to, to address these uh, important issues and which we need to address if we want to have a good society. Thank you. We're coming towards the last sort of five five minutes or so of our conversation. Uh, Demi, let me come back to you um, to talk about this issue of, you know, solidarity and, and bringing societies together, because I know that's an area, obviously, in Slovenia, you've, you, you've dealt with different communities from countries that have quite recently been at war. How do you see adult learning as, as being part of this, you know, glue that can bring society together and help build that solidarity? Well, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, that uh, in our case, uh, with, of course, limited uh, experience and uh, resources and uh, impact so far, but uh, but uh, um, I'd have to say that uh, iteration is the mother of uh, wisdom in our case. Uh, you know, we lots of time we just need to repeat, repeat, repeat all the stuff. You know, if uh, we find that uh, right formula and balance in our work programs, uh, uh, which then work hard, as uh, Wim said, uh, we we got no other options than to work hard, you know, and to, to just trust to our strategy, you know. Uh, we'll only then will make a difference for better with greater outcomes in the future. And if you have solid complementary strategy uh, which does the job, and if you modify it to, fit, uh, to, to best fit your primary groups, then you're on the right path, you know, to create synergies on local level, you know, to, to connect with other stakeholders and decision makers, you know. And, um, uh, but if, as you, uh, we all know, the work is never done in a profession, you know. Um, um, that uh, intergenerational uh, engagement, you know, as we already discussed and uh, the keynote uh, speaker also mentioned before, you know, is one of the hot topics that we are going to work on it in the future inside our uh, prime groups as well, you know. Uh, we don't see a great deal of it that it's on the right level, you know, especially between the older and the younger, you know, they can all learn both sides, uh, one from another and build uh, community uh, engagement on that way and solidarity. Uh, for example, we as Slovene society, uh, I don't want to be uh, disrespectful, we have the great solidarity when it comes to natural catastrophes or uh, whatever, you know, like, but not in Slovene society, also in other regions, you know, we as people come together, we donate, we help as much as we can, you know, but on the other hand, that soft solidarity, uh, intergenerational solidarity, uh, we need to build it, you know, to fit it outwards into our communities, uh, regardless of the cause uh, of the situation, and of course, in our case, regardless of the ethnic origin, so whatever the case is. Yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, and Vim, when we had our, our prep call, you, you gave us this fabulous quote from Animal Farm. I wonder if you want to, to remind us of it, because we've been talking very much about equality, equity and mm. opportunity. But uh, tell us the quote. Yeah, everybody knows it. I'm, I'm sure it's by George Orwell. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Um, and as long as we don't address this inequality issue, uh, we'll not get this paradigm shift we so badly need. And I, and I very much agree with Greta and Damir. Um, all studies say the same, the best prisons, the best prisons in the end to reduce recidivism to a 15% degree is actually small scale prisons, human prisons and, and prisons embedded in society. So we need to build brigs, sorry, we need to build bridges between prisons, which are often islands and the world outside. Why, why, why don't we bring our children into prison and meet with prisoners? Why don't we uh, set up cultural and sports um, projects with uh, people in prison? So that needs to that that badly needs to happen. Build these bridges. Thank you very much. 
Margazata, let me uh, invite you to sort of wrap things up and, and close our panel. Uh, maybe you could reflect a little bit. I mean, we, Erasmus has been around for 30 years uh, now. Um, and as we think about moving forward, we know that European societies are faced with these big challenges. We've talked about them through the last few days, the digital transition, the change in jobs, the post-pandemic shift in everything. What do you hope that er er the Erasmus programme could do going forward. We've heard all the work that from Damir and Rim and Greta, you know, there's, there's huge inequalities in society and education and skills training it is key, but it's not the only thing. So how does it, it, it you see Erasmus Plus um, fitting in the broader range of things that the Commission is trying to do to tackle some of these inequalities? Um, the Erasmus Plus program is the um, EU uh, flagship program. Actually, it's uh, one of the main tools of the implementing the European education area. And uh, the Erasmus Plus program supports the uh, organizations and institutions in providing um, uh, really well tailored uh, education, uh, learning, and training programs for um, learners students and staff and um, uh, because we started the reflections on the on the future program and uh, indeed as uh, uh, also the colleagues in this panel reflected that the world is changing and um, the new problems appear and education needs to uh, needs to follow and needs uh, needs to adapt to the um, to the nowadays circumstances in order to provide uh, the best solutions so uh, the entire Erasmus plus program family will will continue the efforts uh, to, to uh, not uh, leave anyone behind now and in the future Thank you very much. Um, and on behalf of all our audience, I'd like to say a warm thank you to the members of the panel, to Damir, to Vim, to Greta and Malgazata. Um, this panel, we, we dedicated it to Wilma, who is such a passionate and active contributor from Italy. And I think you've, you've done her memory proud, sharing some of the true heart that exists in the community education and a belief in the revolutionary power of education to open up doors. So thank you all for sharing your passion and your stories with us. We're now thank going you. to move to the next section where I promised that we would connect again with a nas another national support service because they are the backbone of the network of Ipali. They make a vibrant community at national level. We always love to give a little spotlight on them and their work. And right now we are going to go to the north, to Lithuania. Uh, to Vilnius. Hello to Sanata Barvaneni. Hello, so, Sanata. Hello. I see some people or a picture behind you. How are you doing? How oh, perfect. We have a rainy, very rainy day here today, but we are still blooming. Oh, lovely to hear that you're blooming. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing this week. Yeah, today we have here a, a Palet thematic conference, uh, Life in Democratic Society. What is important today? And it is devoted to the one of a pilot thematic focuses, engage skills for democratic life. In the first part of the conference, we had a keynote speech about critical thinking and importance of these skills. So Professor Christopher Sabolus had an impressive speech on the topic. Here we have almost 50 people live. Now they are having lunch at the moment. And after the lunch, we will have the afternoon session and I hope that it will be less engageable than the morning, not less engageable than the morning session. So we are here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sanata, and bon appetit to your colleagues who are eating. And I know that this afternoon will be a really lively session. Yeah. So thank you and greetings to everyone in rainy Vilnius. Yeah. Okay, bye. So that was lovely. It's always wonderful to reach out and see um, how each NSS has put their own flavour on the European uh, Ipali community platform. So now I'd like to um, have a little bit of a look at what you have been doing. We At the beginning of two days ago, um, we gave you a couple of hashtags and we invited you to share your thoughts, your ideas, your pictures, your notes, anything that you wanted to share with us. And so now we're going to see 
some of the results of what you've been sharing. And I know that you'll have food for thought, you'll be digesting and you'll still be thinking about it afterwards. But let's see now, we've got a little slideshow to see what you shared with us. Thank you very much for sharing that. And wasn't it lovely to see all those pictures and images and to get a sense of how the Apali community has been coming together over the last couple of days. And just as a reminder, I'm telling you again about the survey because we'd like to make sure we still meet your functions and your interests. You can see the QR code there on the screen. It's a short survey, only a couple of questions, won't take you longer than five minutes, I promise. And there are a couple of questions about this conference to see what you liked about it, what you'd like to see more of for the future. So that's the survey and we'd like you to reply by November. That would be wonderful. So we've come to the end of all of the messages that I wanted to share with you. And it's been such a pleasure over the last couple of years um, and the last couple of days, because I've now uh, been involved in the Apali conference for a number of years. Each time I'm struck by the passion and the commitment and the engagement. And even when times are tough, when the resources are limited and when the sheer numbers of people who need help grow, the, the commitment of the adult education community is absolutely extraordinary. So I want to say a warm thank you to all of you. And this morning we focused very much on inclusion. We looked at how to bring in people, make sure education is a way of opening doors and, and tackling barriers and making sure that we make links between people from different ethnic groups, different ages, from different communities, different classes to bring our societies together and to counterbalance some of that divisiveness that we see in populist message or disinformation and how education can be that social glue in society. So thank you all for participating and being part of this. Now, what I'd like to do is I would like to pass the floor to Willem Vukovic from the European Commission, and he's going to be giving us uh, his takeaways and some analysis of what's been happening over the last few days. Willem, welcome, lovely to see you. Thank you, thank you, Tamsin, and, and uh, a very good morning to everyone. Uh, this sixth uh, Epale Community Conference is coming to an end. Uh, this, year, this year is the European Years of Skills and think that I speak for everybody when I say that this conference has proved to be a small but valuable part in celebrating the year. It was a pleasure to welcome so many of you watching online and those attending the, the conferences, the conference and the conferences in the side events in person. Here are a couple of statistics based on the preliminary analysis of the first uh, uh, two days. So in total, we had more than 3,000 views, more than 500 interactions, more than 180 workshop participants, and what I like very much, uh, more than 600 uh, uh, national site event, event participants. So I may say, uh, already now that this conference is a great success. Uh, Iqbali shows again that it is effective, that it effectively serves the adult learning community. After three years in the pandemic mode uh, with purely online events, we expanded to a hybrid format on the, on the first day. And we, are, we were happy to help more than uh, one dozen side events at national level. We will, of course, draw our lesson and see how we can further improve uh, this so 
so-called new normal. Regarding to the content, I would like to mention some uh, takeaways. Uh, uh, first, uh, the topical issue of artificial intelligence and the emerging technologies. AI is still a relatively new field, and there is uh, there is much we have to uh, yet to comprehend about inner, uh, its inner works. There are also several concerns. It's about privacy, provenience of data, real, uh, reliability of results, and conse consequently, lack of trust. On the other hand, skills in artific artificial intelligence leads to careers that make change uh, that, that make changes in a broad range of areas. For instance, I remember very well uh, what was mentioned that artificial intelligence is helpful in, in diagnosing and treating illnesses. There are also several other fields for uh, AI with high potential growth, such as green technologies for energy supply and usage in more effective supply chains. We learned also that uh, education and acquiring skills are pro a protagonist of social life and, and they open the world. They provide us with a sense of orientation and remind us that we are mastering our lives. And lastly, and this is also a little bit of, a, of the repetition what I have said right now, it is, it is, that, uh, it is about the incorporation of an inclusive perspective uh, and, and fostering uh, dialogue and cooperation. Here again, uh, education and acquiring skills are door openers for freedom a tool for empowering uh, for the empowerment of people and equipping them for taking their lives in their own hands. These are some immediate impressions, perhaps they are also very personal, but as usual, uh, we will prepare a comprehensive report with more in-depth conclusions, which we will, uh, which we will be happy sharing uh, uh, with you on our platform. As we leave this conference, let us carry forward the collaboration, commitment, and drive towards education and acquiring skills. And let us pass it on to many more learners in adult education, in vet, or in the job market. We need to nurture skills not only because of the prosperity it ushers, but because of the resilience it builds in our communities. Capable and skillful people are happier and can help each other much better. Cooperation, doing things together are also key for inclusion. Thank you to all the speakers who kept us focused and shared their knowledge and experience. And once again, I would like to thank uh, the three Belgian Epali National Support Services for hosting this event on the first day. And a big thank you to Tamsin, who has been with us since the first Epali conference with her natural calm and competence, she guided us all smoothly with the great professionalism through the past three days. Thank you and see you all next year. Stay with us on the panel. Back to you, Nancy. Thank you very much, Willem. And, and yes, it's so exciting to see that the community is growing and that there are more and more side events all connected to it because we see that, you know, the, the sort of ripples in the pond moving outwards. It's lovely to see. So now I'd like to introduce to, uh, you to a group of people who are usually behind the scenes, but without which the Apali community could not function. Let me say I'm going to introduce you to the CSS. So this isn't the NSS, we've met some of those, this is the CSS, which means it's the Community Support Services. So I'm going to introduce you, uh, to you, them to you one by one. So first of all, welcome and thank you to Claudia De Ramo and Sara Salieri, who are the editorial coordinators. Then I have Elisabetta Deli Esposite Merli, who's the event manager, and Giacomo Dalle Donne, who's the technical director. Welcome and thank you. I'm going to bring on to the stage Filippo Mantioni, who is the community manager, with Guido Ardania, who's the social media manager, Roberto Sereno, the help desk, Alessia Capasso, the visual designer, Mircea Gulman, the project lead, Matthias Marcioni, the technical backup, with Gianluca Volpe, who's the content assistant, and Sandra Federici, who is the content advisor. So, content manager. So, thank you all. It, look at that, all the faces on screen. That's what it takes 
to run an effective community and a conference. So thank you all for it. And let's, it was a great conference, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, we will see you on the Epali platform interacting in the year, but we will see you again next year for the next Epali Community Conference. Thank you all and goodbye.